Our hope is for you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. After the service, begin that process by connecting with a leader and joining one of our many small groups or teams. But for now, sit back and enjoy this message. What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at in downtown Westside, Monterey. We love you guys. Man, you guys are looking good. Hey, if you're newer to this whole church thing, we just want to just continue to remind everybody, hey, this is not a church service. This is a family. And if you don't have one, we want to adopt you into one. I, I just, you know, there's nothing weirder than just attending a church but not having real relationships and authenticity. And so if you don't have enough friends we just, just hang out a little bit. I, I just, this is, this is why we do this, is that we just wanna be uh, in each other's lives, encouraging each other. I don't know about you, but I could use some encouragement on a daily basis, and I also wanna be an encouragement to other people. And so, hey, if you need that, just welcome home, welcome home. And then, of course, we've been here at this, uh, just over the summertime, I've been doing a series on intimacy. I believe God wants us to have intimacy, not just with each other, but with himself. A lot of people, when they think about God, they think about God as kind of some like distant entity in some universe, and we just learn about him. But actually, that's not how God wants, that, that's not how God intended it. The whole point of Christianity is Christ came to earth to reestablish that connection with the Father. God wants you to be a part of his family, and he wants to communicate with you on a regular basis. And so, uh, and yet, how do you do that, right? I mean, I, it sounds so mystical, like a lot of people, like what does the prophetic voice of God actually sound like? And I wanna, I wanna teach you how to hear the voice of God with clarity and with confidence. And for many of you, I, I, what I wanna do today is I wanna demystify hearing the voice of God. I wanna make it less spooky for you. And, uh, I, I just, and so to set it up, I wanna, I wanna start by just telling you kind of an interesting miracle story of when the Lord first started speaking to me. Um, a while back, I was, I was meditating on a scripture verse, kind of a classic Bible verse out of Jeremiah 33.3. 3. Call to me, God says, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Now, a, a version of this same promise is repeated throughout both the Old and the New Testament dozens of times. New Testament, we got James 1.5. If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask me, God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Okay, so... God is longing for you to ask him, call to me and I will answer you. Great and unsearchable things. Man, I don't know about you, I could use some parenting advice, I could use some marriage advice, I could use some financial advice. How about you guys? I Like career advice? Listen, God wants to speak great and unsearchable things. Notice, unsearchable. Things you can't Google, things you cannot figure out aside from divine providential encounters. Listen, God can orchestrate one divine relationship to give you a piece of information you could never find in a million years of searching. Unsearchable things. Those are the things that God wants to speak to you about. And all he says is, call to me. Well, I read that Bible verse and I'm like, okay, God, if that's really the truth, I don't want to just ask you for for, for insights about me so that it's like I live in some narcissistic world where it's all about me. I want to be used by you to be a conduit for other people, right? I want to be that divine encounter for other people. And so, God, would you speak to me? I, I, started, I started praying that prayer based on that promise, and uh, I, the, the, you'll never believe it. The very day I started praying for it, guess what God started doing? telling me great and unsearchable things. I, I started praying, God, speak to me about my friends. That same day, my wife and I were having a couple, a leader couple from Substance. They were coming over for our house for dinner. And I, I'm like, God, just speak to me. You're like, what, what do they need? Speak to me. And out of nowhere, the moment I prayed that prayer, out of nowhere, I just got this, like, I don't know how else to describe it. It was like this super strong impression on my conscience that felt like it was from the Lord. I'm not sure if it was. But it, it felt like out of nowhere, I just felt this impression, that couple, they are about to be hammered with trials. And then all of a sudden, I went into like daydream sequence where I saw this like storm front coming in, and boom, it hit them so hard, and all sorts of things started going wrong in their lives. 
And then all of a sudden, in that same daydream, I saw the power of God just fall down and just everything dissipated and it was like a sunshiny, happy day. Just like all in like a little, I, I just describe it as like a daydream. And uh, I, I just, I remember after having that, oh, oh the, the, the moral of the thing, the, the moral of the story is tell them not to worry whatsoever, I will take care of everything. And of course, I remembered right after that happened, I kind of snapped out of it, and I remember thinking, was that you, God, or was that my overactive imagination? Come on, have you ever, anybody else have an overactive imagination? I just immediately was like, I don't know if that was you. I was like, in my head, I, I started, you know, I mean, because what, what if it was me, or even worse, what if it was the devil, and then I share that with them, and then I end up adding the very anxiety in their life that they don't need right now, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just, so, so, what do you do in a situation like this? Well, whenever I feel like I might have gotten a prophetic word from the Lord, here's what I do is I scrutinize it using a little list that I like to call the prophetic safeguards. And if you, if you came into church today, we have a little handout for you that we put on your seats. Now, uh, we also are gonna have this online. Uh, if you're watching online, I posted a blog on this at peterhaas.org or just Google Peter Haas plus safeguards. Uh, somebody just told me my website is down, so we also put it on the Substance Church homepage, page, a little banner at the top that says prophetic safeguards. But uh, let me just walk you through them. And this is kind of how I know is it, the Lord, is it me or is it the devil, okay? Just to sort it all out, okay? So the first thing I do is whenever I get an impression that I think might be from the Lord is I judge it according to scripture. Now the tricky thing about this is you actually have to know the scripture in order to be able to judge it with scripture, right? So if you aren't reading your Bibles, this isn't gonna help you much. And yet, this is also the most important one, okay? So let me give you an example of this. Um, you know, the more you, that's why last week I, I kept saying the more you memorize scripture, the more you will walk in the prophetic voice of the Holy Spirit because the number one way the Lord speaks to me is just through scriptures. Is he'll just impress a certain scripture that I've memorized in the past. Uh, and so, uh, like, let me give you an example. I, I, I've actually heard this many times over the years. I had a guy come up to me and he said, yeah. He goes, Pastor, my girlfriend and I were just praying about premarital sex and we just kind of felt a peace that, God was totally okay with it, and so, all green lights. <laughs> and I was like, really? You felt a piece about it? Like, I, I guarantee you, you felt something. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was peace. I think it might have been hormones, but, and, and here's why. And you know, there's 18 books of the New Testament that have a lot to say about keeping fire in the fireplace, so to speak. And so, you know, we had a little talk about the, you know, maybe the, you weren't feeling peace, but maybe you were feeling something else, like lust or something else, but you, you know, and, and then I had another guy come up to me, and he goes, yeah, Pastor, I, I so I, I watch a lot of movies with nudity in them, and I, I started asking the question, should I be watching all of these with my fifth grade son? And, and, and he goes, the Lord just spoke to me, hey, the human body is beautiful, and he gave me a piece about it. And again, I said, really? Okay, by the way, when a pastor says, really, five octaves higher than they normally speak, what they're really saying is, I think your brain got sucked out of your head. You know what I'm saying? It's, <laughs> it, it's you know, it means maybe you better rethink that, okay? Actually, here's the truth, okay? All of us, are gonna feel a peace about really dumb things from time to time. Why? Because the Bible says so. Proverbs 14, 12 says that there is a way that feels right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. Why? Because you have a sin nature. And your sin nature is gonna tell you that feeling is you. That's what you should do. And then you're gonna have to judge it with scripture and all of a sudden the Lord is gonna say, yeah, I wouldn't do that. You see, there's a way that seems right to us, but in the end leads to death. That's why we have to learn scripture and we have to judge our feelings with something bigger. And it's not like God is, God's not up in heaven trying to oppress you. He's actually trying to set you free. And, 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 but, but it's impossible to understand that until we actually read the scriptures on a regular basis. That's why Paul says, you know, Romans 12 two, hey, do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve 
what the Lord's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's not trying to oppress anyone, and just so you know, right here at Substance, we don't wanna oppress anyone. At the same time, we do wanna tell you when the stove is hot. And so that leads to safeguard number two, is you allow your mentors at church, people that know the scripture, to actually scrutinize your impressions. Sometimes you might know a lot of Bible verses, but you don't know the Bible verses that you need to know on that particular subject. And so what you do is you, if you walk with the wise, you will grow wise, Proverbs 13, 20. Right, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. You get around people that know God's word and have been proven to walk successfully in God's word over time, okay? You get mentors in your life. I've got multiple pastors, but I've got dozens of mentors. I've got financial mentors, marital mentors, parenting mentors, and really that's what the church is all about is it's surrounding you with insightful people, okay? So third safeguard, though, is whenever I get a prophetic word for someone else, I'm always telling people, hey, be cautious about subjects that you already have strong opinions about, okay? So if you get a prophetic, let's say you have a friend and you have a strong opinion about what they should do, and then all of a sudden God speaks to you, okay? Listen, I would be hesitant about anything. Whenever God is speaking to me about something I already have a really strong opinion about, okay? In those circumstances, I'm never gonna share that with that person as a prophetic word. I'm never gonna say, thus saith the Lord. I think a lot of people will say, thus saith the Lord. They'll add that to try to add authority to their opinion, which is why all these, like, it's, it's what we saw in this last election when everybody's prophesying about the election, okay? And so much of it didn't actually turn out quite right. You know what I'm saying? What happens is, is people are, they, they're really, their, their opinions are so loud that they can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore, they can't discern it. And so I'm always telling people, hey, listen, be especially cautious about impressions on subjects that you already have a strong opinion about. Uh, and, and so don't get me wrong, I'll share my opinions, but I'm not gonna add, thus saith the Lord to it, okay? You gotta scrutinize it. That's the whole point of this list, is to try to discern, is it us? Is it the devil or is it God? Number four, don't assume, even if you get a prophetic word, don't assume you're supposed to share a prophetic word. If God is speaking to you about somebody, that doesn't necessarily mean you're supposed to share it with them. That's a total separate step. And so that day, the Lord spoke to me about that leader couple. In my heart, I had to ask a follow-up prayer. God, is this something you want me to share with them? totally different. In fact, I actually believe most of the time God speaks to us prophetically, not so that we'll share it, but that so that we'll pray for people more. Does that make sense? It's just, it's, it's God wants to recruit people for prayer. And again, I, I, I talk about this a little bit more um, on my blog, peterhaas.org. Uh, but in church, the reason why I'm talking about this is because people can get really weird when, it talk, when you talk about the prophetic in a church. And yet, it's necessary because it, that's, it's, it's, what, it's the byproduct of intimacy with God. Why does the, the Bible say, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14.1? Why? Because that's how we get intimacy with God. That's how he speaks to us on a regular basis. That's how this turns from a religion into a relationship. You need to learn the prophetic. This isn't something that is just for a limited group of people who might call themselves prophets. This is for everyone. Now, if you have a, a ministry of doing this, then you might be a prophet, but I, I, you get the idea. If you want intimacy with God, you gotta learn these safeguards as well, okay? So even when you know you're supposed to share a word, be wise about how, when, and where you share it. In other words, you, you have to learn how to steward the prophetic in a public forum, okay? So for example, if I get a prophetic word for somebody uh, that I think might be embarrassing to them or triggering to those around them, I'll usually share it with them in private, okay? Or, or I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, I could be wrong. I want you to process this with a mentor. Always share it with humility, these types of things. In fact, I think all prophetic words need to be shared with mentors, like I said in, in, in the step number two. For example, some prophetic words are directive. What do I mean by directive? It, they clarify direction. Between two good ideas, what's the God idea? God's calling you to go to, to college. Well, do you go to this university or do you go to that university? Two good ideas. What's the God idea? You need, you need direction, right? That's what you... That's what we're always praying for is direction. Now, where to work, where to move, who to marry, et cetera. Okay, so now, if someone shares a directive word with you, safeguard number six, let directive words be a confirmation, not an obligation. 
In other words, the point of the prophetic is to confirm what you already sense from the Holy Spirit, not to just lock you into something. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Because a lot of people, they get weird with the prophetic right here. Um, in Acts chapter 20, verse 16, let me, let me just explain to you an example with the Apostle Paul, okay? The Apostle Paul felt led to go to Jerusalem. And so we read in Acts 20, verse 16, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for, here's why, he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. Okay, so Paul is wanting to go to Jerusalem, and of course, six verses later, we actually find out why. He, he actually said he was compelled by the Spirit. So Paul got a prophetic impression. You're supposed to go to Jerusalem. There's a cool ministry opportunity there. And he said, and now compelled by the Spirit, so this is a prophetic thing, compelled by the Spirit, he, Paul writes, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So he feels led to go to Jerusalem, and he knows it's not going to be a fun trip, but he's still supposed to do it. Okay, first off, right there, that also shows us that sometimes God calls us to harder things. Okay, a lot of people think that, oh, well, following God should always just be fun. No, following God will always be joyful, not necessarily fun, okay? And the Apostle Paul gets this impression from the Spirit that he's supposed to go to Jerusalem and that, that hardship and prison are awaiting. And of course, that, that sounds a little tough, but he also knows, hey, this is gonna be awesome if I obey. So he's, he's, he's compelled by the Spirit. Well then, check this out. Okay, we're gonna find out this very thing. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. This happens two more times in the next chapter. Check this out, okay? So Acts 21, finding the disciples there, we, Luke and Paul, and the whole entourage, Paul traveled with about... 30, 40 people, according to scholarship. We stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem, but when our time was up, we left and we continued on our way. In other words, prophetically, they're warning him again, hey, it's not gonna be fun for you in Jerusalem, you know? And, and, and yet Paul knew, no, I'm supposed to go. In other words, he's getting confirmation, but he's not obligated to not go, so he's on his way to Jerusalem. And then check this out, the very next thing, he meets Agabus, the prophet, in Caesarea. And of course, Agabus takes off Paul's belt, and he, and he says, the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So he gets this prophetic word about what's going to happen and in my, the reason why, why would God do this? Because God wanted to continue to confirm, hey, Paul, you've heard me, but no, this is gonna be a hard job. Know this. And, and Paul already knew from years, from, from his conversion, a decade and a half earlier, hey, I've chosen you to suffer for my name. Paul knew this day was coming, and Paul was like, I'm ready, God. Here I am, send me. It was a confirmation, not an obligation, okay? So now the reason this is important is because some people, when they share directive prophetic words or when they receive prophetic, directive prophetic words, they, they get the wrong impression about how, the, the, how prophetic is supposed to work. For example, one time, I've actually heard this many times, but I heard a guy tell a girl, I overheard a guy tell a girl, the Lord says, you're supposed to marry me. Okay, and, and I'm like, really? That's one way to get a first date, okay? That's also manipulation. I immediately grabbed, because I knew this girl was kind of a little innocent and naive, and so I, I pulled her aside as a pastor, and I said, hey, listen, prophetic is confirmatory, not obligatory. Did you, did you like this guy already? Like, did, if you didn't already want to go out on a date with this guy, tell him to take a hike, or even better, I'll tell him, Okay? And she goes, oh my gosh, pastor, thank you for telling me that. I just think he's ugly and weird. And, <sighs> but I didn't want to disobey God. And I'm like, oh, honey, don't ever assume that a prophecy like that is good, especially when it's coming from the very dude who benefits. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, like, really? That guy is just a freakazoid, please. And she goes, well, I thought he was a spiritual pastor. I thought, or I thought he was a spiritual leader in your church. And I'm like, uh-uh, okay, no, like, don't assume any prophecy is good. Prophecy is just a tool in the hands of a mature person 
It can be good, but it, come on. Even in a mature person, they, it's, it, they get it wrong sometimes, okay? So don't ever be afraid to judge the prophetic or put it on the shelf if it doesn't fit. Now, okay, so now with all of these things in mind, let me go back to my original story of that leader couple coming over to my house, and I get this kind of heavy word about them. They're about to go through trials, but don't worry, okay? Now, I, I just... I, I didn't want to, I was afraid to share the word with them because I thought I don't want to create the very anxiety that the word is intended to undermine. And yet I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, Peter, just share it with humility. And so I'm like, hey guys, after dinner, I was like, hey guys, I just, I was praying for you. And I know this might sound a little intense, but I just got this sense that, that, um, and I hope I'm wrong here, but I got this sense that there's going to be a whole bunch of trials that are going to come upon you like a storm but as quickly as they come upon you, they're gonna dissipate, and God says, do not worry, and so promise me you're not gonna worry no matter what, that, that no matter what happens, you're not gonna worry, and they're like, okay, Pastor, for sure, uh, well, for sure, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being obedient. I hope you're wrong too, but, you know, uh, if you're not, then thank you for sharing that, and get this, okay, get this. The very next day, and I don't know why I sound happy about this, they had a terrible day. <laughs> Okay, they had a day from hell. Their son fell, broke his arm. They had to call an ambulance, and it was just awful in the midst. Well, the EMTs are coming. The ambulance is there. The grandma started accusing them of abuse and, and uh, uh, like, making everything worse. While they're in the emergency room, my friend gets a call from his boss who cussed him out and said, you are fired. Don't ever come back. And, and just, why? Like, you know why, and then hung up on him. And they're sitting there in the ER like, this is, I've never had a day this awful, right? And, and yet they immediately thought about the prophetic word that I shared with them the night before and like, well, Pastor Peter said there was like a storm of trials, but not to worry. And, and so what was so crazy about all of it is uh, they, then the very next day, everything got resolved. The boss called back and was like, I am so sorry. I you're not fired. Actually, I totally got it wrong. It was a complete misunderstanding. I thought you did something that somebody else did, and uh, my bad. And of course, you know, he's like, well, then can I get a raise? You know, he's like, yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I owe you everything now. I can't believe I did that to you. And, and then, then the grandma called back. Like, I don't know. I was in a, like a I was so messed up and in so much adrenaline over, you know, my grandson. I said all sorts of hurtful things that I was completely off, that was completely wrong for me to say. And then, of course, you know, their son's arm, the fracture ended up not being bad at all. And it, everything resolved. And, and so my friend called me up and he said, Peter, it was just like you prophesied, massive storm of circumstances. But here's the deal. We did not worry even for a second because your prophetic word was like a hook. We could kind of hang our emotions on and say, hey, God's got us. We're not gonna worry. And that, that was an anchor for our souls. Now, now, after that, I was like, I do hear from the Lord. I am a spiritual person. You know, like every now and again, you know, my wife would be like, yeah, not all the time. But anyway, you, you, get, you get the idea. The reason I'm sharing this is because, listen, I believe that God wants to use us like this all the time. But, but listen, he will also limit this intimacy with him if we are lacking the foundations. Why? Psalm 25, 14. The Lord confides in those who what? Fear him. In other words, have a reverence for him, realizing he's holy, realizing he's, got a di he's altogether different than us. He confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Don't get me wrong. God will give wisdom to anyone generously without finding fault. But if we don't have a fear or reverence, that wisdom will usually come in the form of the school of hard knocks. You know what I mean, the school of hard knocks. Some of you are like, I got my PhD from the school of hard knocks. Listen, God would prefer that you not learn from the school of hard knocks. He would actually prefer that you learn from the school of the prophetic. But where does that come from? It comes from those who fear him. It's a reverence. In other words, people that wait on God. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of receiving wisdom from the Lord. If we lack reverence and if we lack character in our lives, God's going to slow us down. 
He's going to have us learn from one school versus the other. Because, But ultimately, here's where God is taking us. Let me get practical and, and kind of unpack how. How do you walk in this? How do you learn to hear the voice of the, God, of the Lord in a practical basis? I believe that God wants to take all of us through four prophetic levels, okay? Four levels, and you can, st everybody starts out at level one, and some of you, you just stay there. If you're, if you're one of those people where you're like kind of a, maybe a little more intellectual, you're not a mystical person, you know who you are, right? A lot of times, uh, you'll, you'll stay here, okay? And, and, and some people, they're, they're spooky, and they don't start here, okay? So it's, everybody's got kind of a, a natural, uh, predisposition towards another error, but level one is this. It's daily Bible reading. You pick up your, you know, the best way for God to speak to you, the old saying goes, is open up his book and it, his mouth will open. You know what I'm saying? This is how God speaks to you. Just open up your Bible and start reading it. And, and then all of a sudden God will speak. Really, there is a sense in which if you read your Bible out loud to yourself, you're prophesying to yourself, right? Because prophecy is the word of the Lord, right? So if you're reading God's word out loud, you're prophesying to yourself. It may not feel supernatural, but it is supernatural. I was even thinking, like yesterday, I know this is going to sound kind of weird coming from a pastor, but I was not in the mood to read my, my Bible, right? And I thought, you know, some of you were like, I thought all pastors just naturally loved reading their Bibles. Okay, no. And uh, yesterday, I was like, I don't want to read. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm not even going to ask myself if I feel like it. I'm just going to do it. I read my Bible. And out of nowhere, God just spoke to me. It was like, oh, this Bible verse out of the Psalms. It was just like so powerful. In fact, it was so powerful, I had to read it again this morning. It just ministered to me. It was like a promise out of nowhere. You see, you just got to give God a chance by reading your Bible. He will speak when you open up his mouth, okay? That's level one prophetic. They call it, logos is the Greek word for, for God's word, okay? So you, you want God to speak, you open up his word. Well, level two is kind of similar. It's basically, uh, it's a specific Bible verse for a specific person at a specific time. People ask me, when you memorize Bible, like a lot of times when the Lord speaks to me, like I shared last week, it's pretty much God takes a Bible verse that I've memorized and just impresses it at a specific moment for a specific person, okay? Now, when God does that, the logos word becomes a rhema word, okay? Rhema is a Greek word that means a spoken word, okay? So it's a specific Bible verse for a specific person at a specific moment, Logos becomes rhema. That's the level two prophetic. I, I, for those of you who are not very spooky people and you're like, I, I don't know if I want to get overly mystical, well, just start practicing level two. To allow God to, to take the verses you've already memorized or learned and just impress them upon your heart. And when God says, share James 4, 8 with someone, you just do it. Don't ask yourself, is this me or is this, you know, just... It doesn't, if you're wrong and you shared a Bible verse with somebody, it's not going to hurt them, okay? So that's level two prophetic. Now, over time, eventually, you're going to start to be able to discern between the voice of, of, of your flesh and the voice of God, and then you're going to move on to what I like to call level three prophetic. This, th these are prophetic impressions that go beyond Scripture in the sense like, like this, okay? Like Jesus was ministering to the woman at the well in John 4 and 5, and, and he got a supernatural download from the Holy Spirit. Hey, yeah, you've had, you have five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. In other words, God gave him a specific download for a specific woman. Why? For the purpose of evangelism. It ultimately led to revival not only in her life, but in, in, in that whole area, that whole village in Samaria. So, See, you, God wants to give you insights for the purpose of evangelism, supernatural advantages in living life. Now, the point of level three is that these prophetic impressions are, by their very nature, they go beyond the scripture but are still in sync with the scripture. Does that make sense? It'll, got, it'll be like God saying, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to call up so-and-so. It's just a nudge. It, nowhere in the Bible does it say, call up Bob on Thursday, right? But... But, but and then you have to ask the question, well, would it be biblical to call up Bob on Thursday? Well, it's not unbiblical, okay? So it doesn't go, it, it goes beyond the scripture, but it's still in sync with the scripture. It would not be mean. Now, if you were to beat Bob with your cell phone, that would go beyond scripture, right? Okay, or, or like, let me give you another example, okay? Let's say the Holy Spirit tells you, and you come to me, I just want to scrutinize this with you, Pastor Peter. The Holy Spirit spoke to me last week that I'm supposed to kill my boss because they're the Antichrist. 
This is just a hypothetical. Okay? I, uh, no, believe it or not, I did have a guy actually come to me one time and say that, and I was like, let me help you. Uh, but I, I just, no, but let's say you came to me and you said, the Lord spoke to me to kill my boss. Uh, he's the Antichrist. And, and, uh, and now I would probably be like, okay, okay, really? I would probably be like, really? Okay. No, your boss may in fact be a very, very, very bad person, but the Bible says do not kill. Remember that in the Ten Commandments? Okay, so you're I, I, probably not supposed to kill your boss. Um, another thing that would motivate me to say that is because the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, that, that Jesus is going to be the one who will kill the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Okay, so actually you don't have to worry. Jesus will do it. <laughs> if your boss is the Antichrist, okay, so you're off the hook here, okay? So you, you get the idea is that level three goes beyond scripture but is still in sync with scripture, okay? I'm just giving you an example of, of judging prophecy, okay? But the more you know the Bible, the less you get weird about stuff, okay? Finally, level four prophecy is, these are impressions, basically they're level three but with higher risk, okay? It's basically level threes that require time, money, or risk. Uh, let me give you an example, okay? Out of the Bible in Acts chapter eight, um, the, the Bible speak, the Spirit spoke to Philip, the disciple, to walk up to this chariot, which is kind of mystical. If you really think about it, imagine if, if, if the Spirit just kind of in prayer said, I want you to walk down Nicolette Avenue and go hang out around a red car. Okay, so that's basically the equivalent of what God did with Philip. And so Philip goes, hangs out by this car, this chariot. All of a sudden, he hears this guy discussing scripture, and it happens to be the very passage that he is the world expert on. Okay, so then he ends up leading this guy to Christ and baptizes him. It's the, one of the coolest stories in the Bible. And, and of course, in church history, we find out that, that that Ethiopian official that he led to Christ ended up going and starting a revival in Ethiopia. Uh, but it, you, you, you get the idea is that took some time. It took a little extra risk. It wasn't just like an impression. It was like, hey, scrap your day. I want you to do this instead of that, okay? God wants to speak to you with that level of clarity. Did you know that? He wants to tell you how to organize your day. He wants to tell you about what movies to get. It to be downloading. He wants to tell you about all sorts of things. And do this with your kid instead of this with your kid. Say that to your husband rather than that to your husband. He wants to get to that level of clarity. Because in Acts chapter 9, oh, watch this. A guy named Ananias is in prayer. And guess what the Holy Spirit tells him? I want you to go to this particular street address and find a guy named Saul whose job is to kill Christians like you. But don't worry, I'm doing a great work in him and you're gonna fill him with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now that's another level. You better know God before you try to lead a serial killer to Christ, right? I'm just saying. Okay, so, and Ananias does it and boom, Saul becomes Paul and writes half the New Testament, Acts chapter nine. The very next chapter, Acts chapter 10, Peter, the apostle, is on a roof praying and he gets this weird daydream of, uh, of, of, well, I, I won't get into the details, but it ends with the Spirit saying, three foreign men are coming to look for you, and when they come to your knock on your door, you go with them wherever they say. How specific is that? And sure enough, three foreign men come knocking on his door, and it ends up changing the entire course of the church for the Gentiles. You can read it, Acts chapter eight, nine, and 10. Three chapters in a row, where there were level four impressions that ended up resulting in, in countless salvations. Listen, God wants to use you and I for that same purpose. I even think about my wife and I moving here to the Twin Cities. Uh, at the time, I did not wanna move further north. It wasn't like, hey, I wanna, you know, at the time I wanted to move to palm trees, just being fully honest. And yet the Spirit said, no, I want you to move to Roseville and I want you to plant a church there and it's gonna, it's gonna start it's something bigger. And guess what? Over the coming months, people kept coming up to me saying, I had a dream that you moved to the Twin Cities and planted a church. Isn't that weird? And after that happened three times, my wife and I called the elders of our church and we, we transitioned the church and we moved here, okay? So I believe that God does want to lead and guide us, but we also have to become 
grounded before we start walking in the prophetic because if we're not discerning, we can be led forth by our own emotions, okay? So that's, that's why I'm sharing all of this. But listen, none of those miracles in Acts 8, 9, and 10 would have happened had they not been listening to the Holy Spirit, right? Think about it. And, and, and even if they knew how to listen to the Holy Spirit, none of these things would have happened if they were super busy or super stingy, right? I mean, think about it. If they were so busy, if the Apostle Peter already had his schedule booked, when these three foreign men come knocking at his door, I don't have the time to do this. I mean, Philip, think about, like when I read the passage in Acts chapter eight about Philip going up to a chariot, I'm like, did you not have anything better to do? I mean, think about it. Like he's wandering up to a chariot. I'm just gonna hang out by a chariot today. Okay, like if he didn't have the time to hang out next to a chariot, God could have never used him to lead that high official to Christ and that revival never would have happened. You really think about it, supernatural stuff thrives in the margins of our lives. Indeed, all relationships thrive in margin. I believe that if you lack margin in your life and ultimately generosity in your life with your finances, then, then you're gonna be a very limited tool for God to use over time, that's why we practice generosity. That's why we surrender our schedules to the Holy Spirit because God will end up using us more often. But if you're out there and you're like, oh, but I, I, that seems too scary, Pastor Peter. Listen, all you gotta do is start with level one, daily Bible reading, and then allow God to take those Bible verses and start sharing them with strategic people at strategic times, and then, Take it to that next level. When the Lord has grounded you in God's word, you have those guardrails, then all of a sudden, just start allowing him just to nudge you, call so-and-so, or get together with so-and-so, just mainly for prayer. And then eventually, get to level four where God can start using you to create revivals all over the place. One thing is for sure, God does not want you to figure out your life on your own, and he does not want you to live in the school of hard knocks. Come on, can I hear a better amen? Amen. He's got things to share with you, and he, wants, he has things to share through you. And so the question is, do you want to be used by the Lord today? If so, just bow your heads, close your eyes with me, and just allow God to speak right here, right now. God, we come to church because we just want to create space for you to move in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I know that you have so much that you want to share about marriage, parenting, finances, everything, our physical bodies, and yet, God, we need to make space for you to speak. And I pray that you'd help every single person who's heard this message just to really take time and allow you to divinely nudge us. And Lord, if there are people here who are maybe newer to Christ, or maybe they just don't have this type of relationship with you, I pray that they would just take a step closer to you right here and now. Maybe you're here and you've never made Christ the Lord of your life. I just wanna pray a simple little repeat after me prayer that you can do that. And really it's a prayer that you can pray every single day, no matter how long you've been a believer. And if you want that, just let's all do that today, right here together. Just say this after me, say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, and lead me. Starting today and for the rest of my life. If you agree with that prayer, just between you and Jesus, say, I believe. With all that said, we're gonna have our campus pastors coming up and tell us where we're gonna go next. I love you guys.